uh, we're going to talk about is, uh, as they were just mentioning a few moments ago, uh, the second week of when we pray. What my ambition is this morning is I want to take away the idea that prayer is boring and it's burdensome. Uh, there is something that, that we have tied to prayer that we do not pray because we're just not sure it's worth the time or the effort. The great tragedy in life is not unanswered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer. And prayer, what I want us to understand, that it should be so natural to us as born-again believers, as natural as eating, walking, talking, breathing, that prayer just flows out of us. But what we allow prayer to do is that it becomes like the little box that we see so often on a wall somewhere that reads, break glass in case of an emergency. You know, what happens is that we tie prayer to moments of crisis. And that's the only time that we really ever bear down before God is when life caves in, we receive a, a bad report, bad news, and that's what drives us to our knees. But prayer is talked about probably more than anything else among Christians, and it's practiced probably less than anything else that we do. Yet it remains the greatest gift that God has given to you. Prayer, I want you to think about this, is the pipeline. It's the pipeline of communication and interaction between you and your God. Without prayer, you are missing that interaction of God's involvement into your life. So I want to start this morning by talking about the posture of prayer. And there are three elements to this. And I want you to jot these down. I want you to remember these. Again, as it was just mentioned a couple of times already, that on Thursday we started 21 days of prayer and fasting. That you can pick whatever level you want to do during those 21 days. And if you have not started, then I greatly encourage you to jump in and allow God to do something magnificent in your life. So number one, the posture of prayer. And what I'm going to talk about here are the three elements. It's perspective, persistence, and passion. So let's start with the first one. Prayer changes our perspective. You know, prayer, what it does is it opens our eyes to the supernatural, in 2 Kings chapter 6, a story that I have, I have loved since I was a child, it's the story of, of Elisha, and here in 2 Kings chapter 6, let me just read this portion to you, and it says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he might see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots full of fire all around Elisha. Let me tell you, this is in there for a reason. Because when we begin to pray, what happens is that our eyes are open to the supernatural that God will begin to help us see what we're not able to see in the natural, that we begin to see the very things that are hidden in this life. God wants to reveal those things to us in every difficult situation of our lives. We will choose. We will choose to live by a human perspective or a supernatural perspective and it all revolves around our willingness to go before God and to communicate to Him often. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when we pray, we need to learn to pray with persistence. In Colossians 4 and verse 2, here Paul is writing about prayer, and this is, this is his wording. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Another translation states it this way. It says, continue earnestly in prayer. When you go back to the original Greek, the word there is steadfast, meaning devote yourself steadfastly in prayer. And, and here is, 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 the, is what the Bible's telling us, is that prayer really is not given to us as an option, but it's given to us as a mandate 
not a mandate of harshness to put on your life, but God wants it to be a mandate on my life and your life of where we are, are often in prayer, simply that God has the access to help you and to protect you through this life of trouble. When you read through the Bible, you find that there are, are two parables in which Jesus talked about referring to prayer, and they're the most instructive parables on prayer that you'll, that you'll find in the entirety of the Word. And it's found in two different chapters in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18. Now, you will find this incredibly intriguing. In the next few moments, do not let your mind wander. Because here the question was, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Lord, let us understand what prayer is all about. And so when they ask this, he just goes into a story, into a parable. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answered from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he did not get up and give him anything, because he was his friend at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Now, in this story, he's saying that this man comes knocking at the door in need of three loaves of bread at the hour of midnight, an ungodly hour, and he's asking, and he finally receives, not because the man on the inside cares for him or loves him, but he gets up, because the persistence of the knocking, and it will not stop until he gets what he needs. Now, I want you to flip over to chapter 18. And here Jesus tells another story. The same question has been asked to him about prayer. He tells the same story, but he changes the characters in the story. And here in Luke 18, this is how it goes. Verse 1. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. And he said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. But, a while, but, but for a while he refused. But later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continuing to come. Now Jesus in these two stories unbelievably is saying that praying to God is like this. And when I read these stories, what comes to mind is I'm wanting to say, seriously? I mean, Jesus, are, are you really comparing God to a non-caring friend and a grumpy old judge? That's how you are, are saying that God is, that when we come asking in prayer, that, that we only receive from God when we come to the place that we're irritating him to death and that we become a bother to him, not because he loves us, but because there is a constant knocking at the door. In every parable, and this is what is interesting and that we must understand, every parable that Jesus tells, there's a twist to the story that there's always this shock value that when he speaks the story, that it shocks everyone like these two stories shock us this morning. But when the parable is spoken, he does it in such a way that it forces you to think about where am I in the story and who is God in the story? 
When you think about who you are, then I must be the one who is knocking at the door that I'm in need, and God's the one on the inside who, who's an irritated friend. Or in the other story, that I must be the widow that, that's coming, and, and that I'm in great need of justice, and God is the grumpy old judge that finally gives what we want because we're absolutely wearing him out. And the way that Jesus communicates this parable forces every single person to stop, to ponder, and then to understand. Jesus' point in both of these stories was not to compare God to an irritated friend or an unjust judge, but in contrast of that if an unwilling friend And a grumpy old judge will give you what you need because of your persistence. How much more will a loving father who created you, breathed life into you, loves you, cares about you, wants to spend eternity with you when you come knocking at the door, how much more is God going to respond to you and how much more quickly? Then Jesus here in Luke 11 At the end of this parable, he says this, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and and it will be opened to you. When you look at these three words, ask, seek, knock, they're verbs. They're action words in present tense. It's not past tense of where you're saying, I've already prayed about that. I've prayed about it over a hundred times. God's not doing anything, but it's the present tense that we never stop, we keep asking, we keep seeking, we keep knocking because persistence, fighting through the spiritual warfare, fighting through the the problems and the issues that God will respond to you. It's a promise. George Muller, one of the greatest prayer warriors in our past, made this statement. He said, it's a common temptation of Satan to make us give up too soon. The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we ought to continue to read it. And the way to obtain a spirit of prayer is to continue praying. The less we read the word of God, the less we desire to read it. And the less we pray, the less we desire to pray. What he's saying here is that we must be dedicated to persistent prayer. That we push ourselves in this area of life more than anything else we do. As being a success at work, or being in top physical shape, that prayer is above all of these disciplines in our lives that we must be. 21 days of prayer and fasting, what happens is that throughout the day, you begin to feel the hunger pain. You begin to feel this intense hunger desire for food. What happens immediately is it reminds you of what you're doing. It reminds you that you are centering yourself upon the things of God. And every time that, that, that little tinge of hunger comes, that you remember, I'm praying. I'm praying, I'm seeking God. And what it does in 21 days is it throws you back into the system and the habit of a continual prayer life all throughout your day. The second thing, or the third thing that I want to share with you here when it comes to our posture of prayer is that we are to pray with passion. Paul, when he talked about prayer in his own life, and he was talking to the churches, he used the word vigilant. That we should be vigilant when it comes to our prayer. It's the opposite of slothfulness. Now, I want to pause for a moment, and I want to ask all of us, have we become slothful in our communication with God? And if so, this morning, we need to repent. Let me tell you, as I've gone into this 21 days of prayer and fasting, I personally have repented over that saying, God, that my prayer is, has become slothful, not the intensity that, that I know, that I know that it needs to, to be, and it's a reminder of that. 
I want you to notice and remember when in Jesus' life that has been so well spelled out for us in the Bible that Jesus turned to prayer, and he turned to prayer in moments of emergency, when he was perplexed, when he was hard-pressed and tempted and criticized and fatigued physically and weary spiritually. There was no difficulty, no necessity, no temptation that he did not go to God in prayer because Jesus had the right perspective, that Jesus was persistent, Jesus was passionate in his prayers. You see, when we pray, and again, this is extremely important in our society today, that when we pray that it's got to be a heart issue instead of a head issue. What I mean by that is, is that when it comes from the heart and we're praying and we're communicating, what that is, it's building a relationship with Christ. But when it's from the head, what it's doing is that I know the Word of God, I know what is right, and yet it's missing that emotion, the passion, and it creates dead religion inside of us. In Matthew 6, 7, when Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and he was talking about prayer and he was telling them how to pray, he says, when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Meaningless repetitions. Now, Gentiles were pagans. The Gentiles, they prayed religious prayers of repetition. What they did, they would stand before idols and they would chant the same words over and over, day after day. And think about this, that no relationship can ever be built on memorized phrases and chants. It would not work with any of us at any level. You cannot build a relationship like that. What God is after is not repetition, chants, but he wants a relationship and communication with you. And so he said, So I want you to look at this. In Matthew 6, 7, when you pray, he's talking about don't use meaningless repetition. And he's talking about the Lord's prayer as he begins to lay it out. But I want you to look at what we have done to the Lord's prayer over time. That we quote it, we memorize it, that we almost use it as a magic mantra in our lives, hoping that if we say that prayer word by word, that somehow it'll bring a blessing upon our lives. And the mass population is doing exactly with that prayer what Jesus said, do not do. The Lord's Prayer was never designed for us to memorize it and quote it as a prayer. It was laid out for us as a guide to follow in our prayer life. It was laid out as an outline of how we are to pray, and yet we have turned it into this thing of where we just memorize it, we quote it, and there's absolutely no meaning whatsoever to it on most cases. Now, I want you to think about if you're really building a relationship with Christ. Relationships are built on emotion, love, passion, expression. Relationships are not built on empty rhetoric of just words that are spoken. And we've been given this amazing opportunity and an amazing privilege of entering in and communicating with a living God. In Jeremiah 29, 12, it says, Then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear, and I will listen to you. That's a promise. That's a promise that God will listen and respond to you. It does not matter how deep in sin you are this morning. It has nothing to do with how many failures in life there are. It doesn't matter how addicted you are. What the promise is, is if you'll call upon me, I will listen to you, and I will hear you, and I will respond to you. But I think here is the huge misconception when it comes to prayer. That when we pray, that we feel like we have to go and find this private 
place of prayer somewhere. I mean, where am I going to pray? I mean, is it going to be at the church or in a back bedroom in my house or in the backyard? Where am I going to find this place of prayer that we have in our minds? Do I have to have all these long prayers, pray for 30 minutes, pray for an hour, that I have to have all of these eloquent uh, words as I pray? But that's not the case. Because let me tell you what God longs for. God longs for these simple, short prayers throughout the day, such as getting up in the morning and saying, God, thank you for this breakfast. God, today, help me stay calm in this traffic jam. Lord, help me to love this person that I'm speaking to right now. God, I I pray, show me what to do that I'm so confused that I don't know what to do. Or just lifting up your voice and saying, God, I love you today. Or, good night, Lord, looking forward to spending time with you in the morning. You see, it's not waiting for the right time, not waiting for the perfect words, not waiting because you feel dirty and sinful and you just don't even feel like you can come before God. But it's often lifting up your voice in the morning, on your way to work, while you walk the dog, making dinner, feeling righteous, feeling unrighteous, because God stands waiting to hear from you. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, rejoice always and delight in your faith. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. Another translation says, pray without ceasing. I mean, is that even possible? I mean, how do we even get to that point of where there's a constant prayer flowing out of our mouths? Well, try this experiment. You have your journals, jot this down. Start every morning and end every day with prayer. Again, it doesn't have to be this long, massive prayer. It's just you start the day and you end the day. In between those, during the day, pray over your schedule. Say, God, I'm praying over my to-do list today. Be with me. God, I'm praying that that when I hear these troubled reports on the news, that I pray over those. That when my spouse or my child comes to mind, that I will pray over them. That I will pray for the person that I'm speaking to right now. And you look for prayer moments throughout the day. The three elements that we need to establish into our life is persistence, perspective, and passion. Now, the second thing that I want to wrap this up with is I want to talk about how to pray. What I want to do in the next few moments, I want to get as practical and as easy as I possibly can. But I want to show you the value of establishing this in our lives in some way. First of all, the first one is When we pray, praise him. Praise God. When Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, here in Matthew 6, 9, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Or again, our Father, which thou art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What he was saying is start by magnifying your God when you address him. You know, most of my life, this goes back all the way to my teenage years, that I have used this as a guide that every time I go before God, that I spend a moment just beginning to praise Him, that I begin to pray and say, God, I thank you for your power, for your greatness, for your majesty, for your love. And what I know I'm doing is I'm honoring my God by doing so. But I also understand this that when I begin to verbalize those words, that it begins to build my faith, that as I begin to verbalize the attributes of God, that God, you are the creator, the designer, the one who is in total control, the one who loves me and cares for me, all of a sudden it begins to build this confidence that I'm a child of God in the hands of a God that has everything in control. That we start by praise. The second thing that we do as we pray this week is here's another great thing to add to your prayer list. And guys, I want to tell you, this may be one of the most important things you can pray. And here it is. Ask God to protect your heart. 
So often I have found some of the writings, and most of the time they're from King David. Let me, let me share one of these with you that, that I've prayed so many times. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, what David was doing and what we ought to be doing is saying, God, challenge my heart today. God, challenge and, and reveal to me my, my wrongs. It's so easy to get into a pattern of life of where we're doing things wrong that we never even think about it. But when you're going before God saying, God, shine a light on my wrongs, shine a light, challenge me on my words, my attitude, my actions, reveal my weaknesses. God, reveal my pride or my hatred or my greed, reveal those things. As you were saying, God, challenge me to, to, to understand where I'm going in a wrong direction. Challenge and change my worry into a spirit of peace. God, change my irritability into a spirit of patience. God, change my negative spirit into a spirit, into a positive spirit, and God will begin to be activated by your words. And that he will challenge you, sharpen you, and change you. In Titus 2 and verse 12, here is speaking about the Spirit of God that moves upon us. Listen to this. And it teaches us the Spirit of God in your moments of communication. Teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present life or age. You see, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you, guide you, help you if you are requesting His help. Do you realize that 90% of all of our problems and the stress in which we are under every single day is self-inflicted by our carelessness in words, by our carelessness in attitude, by sinful actions that get us into all kinds of issues and problems and relational issues. 90% of our problems are self-inflicted because we're simply not being led and challenged by the Holy Spirit. Here's something else, the next one. Something else we can add to our prayer list. And in prayer life is ask God to provide for you. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. What should we be praying about? Everything. I mean, I don't even know what to pray. I mean, I pray for three minutes, then what? Pray for everything. Here it says, instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Guys, what I love about being at my age is the perspective that I have today that I've never had in my life. I'm living with a perspective that I did not have in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, in my 50s. But what I have today is a perspective of looking back and seeing how God has magnificently provided for me. That when I was all the way back over here in the 20s and 30s, saying, God, where are you? Where are you? God, I need you to show up. God, I, I'm struggling. I can't pay my bills. I don't know what to do. God, where are you? Do you even care about me? And as you just continue rolling, staying faithful, staying faithful, you begin to look over your shoulder, and you see this magnificent hand of God that has done these works in your life, shifting and moving and working, and and you just see how God has done so many beautiful things. You know, one of the things that I did not do, but I wish I would have. If you're a young family, I would encourage you, and now this is a great time for me to reestablish this with grandkids, is just to get a box. Get a box and put it on your coffee table. And where there's 
paper on the inside and every single day write something that God has done in your life. When you come to the end of the year, and maybe it's at Christmas season, when the whole family is sitting around the table and you pull out the box, you pass out all the papers, and people begin to read them one by one, it'll blow you away at the interaction of what God has done in your family, in your lives, the miracles and and the things that you have forgotten about. Because what we need is the right perspective of that God is in our lives every single day of our lives. God wants to work in our lives. The next thing that I want to share with you is, is guidance, and I'll end with this one. Here's another big thing that we ought to be praying for every day. God, guide me through your magnificent spirit. By the Holy Spirit, God, guide me. Guys, do you realize how messed up so many lives are today by choices that people have made? Choices. You see, our level of of life, good or bad, is all about the choice that you make. That's why choices are so important. It's crazy to me how people make decisions. Reminds me of the woman who went to to the Rockies on vacation, flew there, was very excited, had never been there. She arrived and she was overwhelmed by the beauty of the mountains, the beautiful blue sky, the, 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 the smell of the pines, and she was staying at a dude ranch and where people would go and stay there and stay on vacation. And, and so one day when they were touring around and, and here on this cattle ranch, that the uh, young single man that was running that, uh, she was captivated by. I mean, she thought, whoa, I mean, this is a good looking guy. Well, she spent a lot of time with him that week and they just kind of clicked and And uh, he lived in a beautiful log cabin right there on the property. One evening, he invited her to come to the the log cabin and to come and have dinner with her. They sat down. She's looking around. It is so beautifully built. It is gorgeous. The fireplace is going. And they had such a great dinner there in the log cabin. Well, it was at the end of the week. She was getting ready to leave, and they had such a great time to her surprise He knelt down on one knee and said, would you marry me? She was so taken back by that that we'd only known each other for a week and she didn't know what to do and and, and she she thought and thought and thought and she just said, you know, I've got to go home and think about this. She got on the airplane and was flying home and she was restless, haunted by did I do the right thing, the wrong thing, what should I do? It was in the middle of that flight. She gets up goes back into that tiny little restaurant, restroom on the plane and, and she's looking in the mirror and she's splashing water on her face and she's staring at herself in the mirror saying, what do I do? What do I do? And at that moment, they hit turbulence and those turbulence started shaking the plane and then there was a sign that lit up there in the bathroom and the sign simply read, please return to the cabin. Well, the next day... She returned to the cabin in the Rockies. (laughs) Foolish assumptions. Guys, I have watched people make life-altering decisions on things just like that. It's not by goofy things. It's by the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit that is turning on the inside of you, allowing you to know what is right and what is wrong And here this story basically reveals the common denominator in our lives is that we're so confused that we don't know what to do and what decision do we make. But it's when you pray and you're saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me. The Holy Spirit is called your counselor. He's called your guide. And when you are praying, and this is what I hold to all the time, I'm up against decisions all the time that I don't know what to do. And I'm just saying, God, I am lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know which direction. Do I do this or do I do that? But here's the confidence. If I'm on my knees praying and saying, God, let me not make a mistake. 
God, you're not trying to hide this from me. You want to reveal this to me. Whatever I do, whichever direction, let it be led by, by the leading of the Holy Spirit that I'm not going to miss this. I want you. I want you. I want your perfect will. And what I find is through that prayer, God will supernaturally guide me. If I'm going this way, all of a sudden into this direction and make the right decision every single time because God wants you to know what the will of God is. He's not hiding it from you. But you know what? Here's the other side of that. Is that you have to honor and obey the Word of God. I mean, you cannot follow unethical business practices and then ask that God would, would bless you and, and send you down a perfect path. You cannot date an unbeliever and ask God to bless that, that marriage. You cannot decide to treat your wife disrespectfully and expect God to even listen to your prayer. Because in the book of James, it says that very same, that very thing. That husbands, when you disrespect your wives, it says don't even think that God's going to hear one of your prayers. So when we line up to the Word of God, line up to Him, we don't have to be perfect by any means. It's just a humble heart saying, God, in my weakness, in my failures, I just want to find your will. Here in Psalm 25, David is praying and he says, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. Teach me for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Well, what a, what a sincere prayer. Proverbs 3, 6. Seek his will in all that you do. And he will show you which path to take. Because again, he's not hiding your future from you. Oh, we think about prayer a lot. Oh, we'll say, man, pray for me. Pastor, pray for me. To a friend, pray for me. But how much are you praying? Or how much am I praying? Prayer changes everything. In your mindset, if prayer is boring, as I said in the beginning, if it's burdensome, shake that off. Shake that off. Shake, shake whatever seems to be, you know, that just kind of makes you cringe. But then recreate it as something so enjoyable. Or maybe your, your quiet time and maybe even a kind of a prayer time could be at your house. It could be at a Starbucks. Man, it could be a, at one of your favorite places. You know, sitting at a, at a coffee shop outside, out in the sun. You're just writing as you're praying quietly in your mind and you're just jotting down what you feel like God is saying, it becomes one of the most enjoyable moments of your day. I want to ask everyone to stand. If you're there in Maui, I want you to stand to your feet. I want to pray with all of you as well. And today, so basic, so simple, can we reestablish this prayer thing in our life? Can Copper Point become people of prayer? Can we start this today as we walk out of here where these little short phrases constantly throughout the day, constantly, 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 man, you're irritated at a boss at work, God, help me stay calm. Help my words. Help me speak with wisdom. Help me today. Getting ready to walk into my house at the end of work. I'm tired and weary. And I know when I walk in those doors, the kids are going to be fighting with one another. It's going to be turmoil. But God, I pray, help me to walk in as a leader. As a leader. As a father. As a mother. And God, let me bring peace into this household. You see, it's little prayers like that come from the heart, not from the head, from the heart. It's what changes things. What do you need this morning? What's heavy on you? 
Some of you in this building, you're struggling in your marriage, struggling in finance, struggling in relationships, struggling at work, struggling with family members. You know, whatever it is, it says everything, everything in prayer. God wants to hear everything. You know, when I'm with my own children, my grown children now, you know what I love is I just love sitting somewhere and listening to them, to them talk. I mean about nonsense stuff, but I love it. I just love it. You know what? God's the same way. You may think it's nonsense. He doesn't care about that. He's got bigger things to take care of. No, he doesn't. You're his son and daughter. He wants to hear everything. 